for everyone with an interest in NASH, or more broadly, fatty liver disease, Surf's Up, Season 3, Episode 17 of Surfing the NASH Tsunami, our look at single-cell genomics and where it's heading, starts now. This week on Surfing the NASH Tsunami. We know that NASH primarily starts in hepatocytes and the accumulation of fat. Most patients with fat in the liver never get NASH. What we need to start with as the drivers is what distinguishes those fatty livers that also go on to accumulate inflammation and cell damage. But the point is that that's really driving the stellate cells to make fibrosis. So I quite agree with Neil and Steve that you certainly can clear fibrogenic cells, but unless you're turning off the faucet of inflammation and cell damage, you're paddling upstream. And you days of when we took tissue and just mashed it up together and read out all the RNA sequence from that. It's like a bunch of fruit in a blender and blended up just into a smoothie. Moving on from that, you can see what the individual fruit in the smoothie are. Then the next step is seeing its beautiful in situness on the top of a, a lovely tart where you can see spatially where the grapes are relative to the kiwi fruit, relative to the slices of banana. As I sit here and listen to this, I feel like I'm at an archaeological dig site where we know there's something down there because we found a very tip of it and we're starting to take our brushes and our little instruments and start to whittle away at the dirt and expose what's really underneath. We're just at the very tip of that archaeological dig and yet we're trying to drive therapeutics to manipulate the liver disease without fully understanding or appreciating what we're dealing with. Straight out question, have you had the opportunity to look and get some impression on how much individual variation there is between individuals? Some of our cohorts in certain diseases are up around the 40 mark now and it's actually quite remarkable how in certain in cell lineages, the commonality there is across patients. Which is reassuring because it means you can use it to actually identify drug targets for treatment. One in ten alcoholics will get cirrhosis, the other nine won't. That excitement about being able to find out upstream what we're changing or what, what doesn't work and what does work. But what really are the risks? Is there a risk of if we target regeneration that we can over-regenerate the liver with new tissue and therefore actually increase fibrosis and create the problem we're trying to solve? As I was listening to you, one of the reactions I had was for years when you drove it north out of Pennsylvania in New York Airport, there was a billboard just before you got there from Prudential that said the first 150-year-old in history has already been born. Listening to that sequence of technology, you start to understand how people could get there. Every week, a global community of fatty liver disease stakeholders comes together to explore the most important challenges in diagnosing, treating, and developing medications for patients with fatty liver diseases. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader, Dr. Stephen Harrison, liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, pricing and forecasting guru Roger Green, and this week's guests, hepatology researchers and key opinion leaders professors Scott Friedman, Neil Henderson, and Jarn Schottenberg, as they discuss advances and expectations for single-cell genomics, this week on Surfing the Nash Tsunami. Для всіх, хто цікавиться мережею NASH або загалом жировою хворобою печінки, ловіть хвилю. First of all, thanks again to Anna Tokar, who has translated our opening sentence into uh, Ukrainian. And as we said, we will continue to open in English and Ukrainian as long as the Ukrainians are living under the burden that they are right now. So, Anna, thank you for that. I will close in Ukrainian also, as we've now gotten into the habit of doing. And so far, at least no one has sent me a letter telling me how bad my accent is. So I either take that as lots of people being polite or it being encouraging or maybe a little bit of both. Just to kick off before we get started, Academy Awards last night. I'm not going to talk about Will Smith, but I am going to talk about Coda. I've been a big fan of Death stage theater. I've always found it amazing and emotional and really powerful. And anyone who saw Coda can appreciate how that works because, boy, it worked in that movie. Uh, Marley Matlin observed last night that she hopes that this movie and the Troy Kotzer Award open the floodgates to a larger global audience to appreciate deaf stage theater and maybe see more deaf film. If you've not seen deaf stage theater, I recommend you go. It's really just an amazing thing. That's number one. Then number two is we're going to broaden the topic for today's episode. Originally, we were going to talk solely about the CAR-T mRNA research and combination work in 
question nice on what that had to tell us. Unfortunately, Dr. Epstein wasn't able to, Epstein wasn't able to join us. So we're going to, Scott will talk some about that. And Neil Henderson, who's with us today, will talk about his work in single cell genomics. And cumulatively, this should be a fantastic episode. Last September, when we did the episode on Paris Nash, and then after that one with Lars Johansson and one with Scott, those were some of our highest rated episodes. Actually, those increased the overall listenership for this podcast 25 to 30% after than what we'd been expecting before that. So hopefully, uh, Neil, no pressure to show up for the first time and have to increase our audience 30%, but I'm confident you're up to it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think Scott's a better bet for that than me. Well, but Scott's already had his shot, right? So so now, now it's your turn, and, and, and we, we know who to blame if it goes south. At, at any rate, so let, let me just start by saying that Stephen is back, snuffing not been with us for a couple of weeks, but uh, he's back, and in fact, for those of you who can see, he's got headphones and mouthpiece, which is a great thing. Stephen, how are you today? Yeah, I'm doing good. And uh, Louise, if you can see the video, she's dressed in um, Liverpool red with Minnie Mouse and a flower, a celebration of everything she loves best about the month of April, I'm guessing. How are you? I'm very well, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to see Stephen again. I missed you. Yeah, I missed you too. We'll be, we'll be getting everybody in the same place soon, I hope and expect. Yarn, how are you this week? Yes, Roger, I'm fine. Thanks. Great to be here. And uh, especially with this great set of colleagues and looking forward to the discussion. And it's still sunlight, huh? In, uh, in Mainz. That's true. We flip the clock and, you know, staying up uh, longer at night with the light out gives you more energy. So that's great. Excellent. And Scott, how are you today? I'm good. Still thinking about the Oscars last night. By the way, did you know what CODA stands for or was I the last person to know? Yes, I did, actually. Children of deaf adults. Yeah. Yeah. Who knew? I, what I found fascinating is how elegant and expressive sign language can be. You could really uh, feel the emotion and uh, you wouldn't think so, but it was quite striking. Yes. And Scott, that was... If if you go to deaf stage theater, it's all the more, maybe 10 times more powerful. It's just an extraordinary experience. So, yeah, thanks. And that brings us to our, our colleague, uh, Neil Henderson. How's life in Edinburgh today, Neil? Good, yeah. We've had a blast of sunny weather for about a week now. To be fair, often um, April, May, June's the best months in Edinburgh. So, yeah, can't complain. Spring is springing. It's uh, the countryside's green. It's nice. Excellent. Actually, when Neil and I spoke last week, we were witnessing similar weather, both about 8 or 10 degrees Celsius, both gloomy and cloudy and a little bit foggy. I explained mine. He said, that sounds like what we live with all year. So I'm, I'm happy to hear you're having a sunny week. And let me ask you to get us started. As, uh, since Neil's not been with us before, Neil, do us a favor. Take a couple of minutes and talk about your work history and your work and kind of what you do now and how you got to that place. And then please wrap it up with one fact that no one would know about you if you didn't share it today. <laughs> Yeah, that's a dangerous one, isn't it? Um, I'll start. I'll start with the, the easier stuff, maybe. So, so I'm a hepatologist, a liver physician. I went to med school in Edinburgh and then went down south to London for a bit, then returned back to Edinburgh. Decided I was going to specialise in hepatology. It was either that or cardiology. But yeah, I would say it's fair to say I saw the light and became a hepatologist. And then, following my PhD, I trained to consultant level and then went over to San Francisco to UCSF to do a postdoc fellowship for three years there in Dean Shepherd's lab at Mission Bay. Fantastic experience. Didn't overlap with Scott there, but, but got to know him over the last 15, 20 years or so, which has been great. And then I came back to Edinburgh and I've been back around nine years now uh, setting up my own group. So we do a lot of basic science, but also quite a lot of translational work now. And I think others would maybe agree that, you know, we, we used to do an awful lot of rodent work, but in a in a good way, emphasis has shifted into, you know, starting with, with human tissue and, and really analysing that in depth. And so over the last few years, we've embraced a new technology called single cell genomics, which has just given us incredible precision and resolution on, on what's going on in human livers. So we do a lot on liver fibrosis and other organ fibrosis in my lab and also liver regeneration work. So I guess I'm a, a clinician scientist based in Edinburgh is the short summary. That's excellent. And the one fact is? Okay. So at medical school, we had something called the Med School Review, which is an annual thing that still goes on at Edinburgh Medical School. And it's debauchery is what I'll front end this story with. So this is actually a mild story I'm going to tell you. But when it was our turn, in my year to do the med school review, we decided to become a dance troupe to emulate a band called Take That, which you may remember were a big boy band. And I think they made it big-ish in the States. I know Louise will know who I'm talking about. So we covered Relight My Fire and we're watched by the entire medical school. It's a very beery evening, which is a good start when you're on stage. And we all wore gold hot pants. This is me and my four male flatmates. And we had crop t-shirts. And the finale 
to our, I have to say, highly practiced and very coordinated uh, dance routine was I would lift one of my female friends, Claire, onto my shoulders. And so we practiced this many times and that all went very smoothly for the big finale, holding Claire here. And then one of my so-called friends in the front row of the audience shot out onto the stage and pulled down my gold hot pants. Now, I was able to collapse as quickly as you would when somebody's trying to do that, but key in my mind was making sure Claire was safe when we hit the deck, which I'm proud to say I did, and then assumed the fetal position as quickly as I can. So unless you were there that night, you probably don't know that about me. It's not a pretty picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what can my friend said. Can we relive that at easel? Because <laughs> I can think of quite a few hepatologists in me up for that. <laughs> And I, I was going to ask you if you had your clothes on, and you answered before I could even ask. Yeah, yeah, and I'm proud to say that the gold hot pants got lost in the mist of time. So, um, yeah, no more of them. So, Neil, you know, occasionally we have honorific guests, gifts for guests who perform specially well. So, I think we might be able to dig up another pair of the gold hot pants if you want to do a repeat performance. They'll have to yeah. surfing with yeah. a Nash logo on them, but uh, but you'll be repping for us. It'll be one. Kylie and Oaks are in a museum, so I wonder where yours are. <laughs> Well, that's true. That's true. Yeah, you're right. She knew it better than I did, I can tell you that. <laughs> okay. So with that, I think you started this groundbreaker process spectacularly well. Thanks. Okay. To start, you know, keep going. One good thing in the past week that's happened for you personally and professionally, and then after that, we'll go brave one first through the rest of us. Okay. I have three kids, the eldest of whom is 19. She's at university, first year at university this year. And she didn't, as far as we know, have a boyfriend when she was in high school, but she has a boyfriend now. So she brought Jacob up to, to meet us, and he's with us for a week. And so the best thing that's happened to me is that he seems like a normal nice guy. That's a big deal. Yeah. That's a big deal. All of us fathers of daughters over the age of six understand exactly how important that is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Brave one, go next. Oh, I'll go next. Um, we've just completed a NHS trust catch-up for a fibrous gun list that was a year long. So over 160 appointments in five and a half days. And boy, is there some liver disease out there. And I could have recruited for a NASH study just in five days and had leftovers. So it's a concern if this is anything to go by. It was great to get that many fibre scans done that quickly, and it was great to now get people who really do need care into the process. Not uplifting per se, but excellent. That's great. And my positive, I've so far I'm COVID negative, flying to Australia on Sunday night, so touch wood, then I will remain COVID negative for my PCR on Friday. If you hear Louise's voice on our podcast next week, that will mean she was not fortunate enough to remain COVID negative, because if she's COVID negative, she'll be in the air and will actually miss our podcast next week. She did make the comment, however, though, that if we have Jeff Lazarus with us, as we will next week, she thought she might be rendered at least partially redundant. So um, so we'll, 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 we'll go with that for now. Next. Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll go, Louise. So as far as the PCR stuff goes, I've booked my trip for London for the Litmus Consortium, which will be May the 5th and 6th. And I don't have to have any testing now. You don't have to be tested before you go, when you land. I don't even have to show proof of my vaccination status. It's it's a breath of fresh air to see that. And Neil, to your comment, I have a 19-year-old daughter as well who's a, a first-year college student, and she's been with a boyfriend for about a year now. And uh, every now and then I remind him that nobody, nobody will love my daughter as much as daddy ever. <laughs> So I let him keep that in perspective. Did you also tell him you know how to operate a loaded weapon? <laughs> I, I show him my my uh, full bird colonel uniform frequently. Exactly. Yes. Stephen is a show don't tell kind of guy. <laughs> and, and and my nine millimeter and my and my uh, AR fifteen and <laughs> various other weapons that are lying around the house. So I you know for me professionally it was it was a good week. Paper we've been trying to get into Lancet uh, finally. I just met with the editor right before coming on the podcast, and I think we ironed out the last little bit of modifications that need to be made to the paper, and so that that should be forthcoming. So that's nice to to get one of those across the finish line. Bravo! Thanks. What can I say? Another Harrison paper in the Lancet, right? Great. Congratulations, Stephen. I'll be interesting to read it. Anyways, personally, I went to uh, Vienna last week to meet with UEGW or to plan for UEGW. It's the European Gastroenterologists Week, and we actually met 
met there in person to decide on the next year's program and, and start the planning, sharing the excitement about coming back to a situation where you can travel more freely. That was a good start. And I, I think we have an exciting program for that meeting. So I actually shared this with you folks before we went on, and I got a nice unexpected notice that my faculty has awarded me the Lifetime Achievement Award for my institution, which is beyond thrilling. It's nice to know you've made an impact. That's super. I also pointed out to them this is not intended, and nor do I take it as an invitation to retire. I'm still going strong and enjoying the science. And apropos of that, uh, we shared a manuscript with Dr. Henderson that we've been working on for some time that we're real excited about. We'll keep it under wraps until uh, everybody's on board, but we're happy with the science we're doing. And a lot of it builds on what Neil and his group have done. That's terrific. You know, when AASLD came out with the, uh, the fellow designation, right, we call that fossil right because it's fellow aasld so so see now now you're a fossil and you're, you're you are you have another honor i'm a lifetime fossil <laughs> <laughs> congratulations scott well deserved good. absolutely good. congratulations right. does that make you good if you're a lifetime fossil does that make you good for another 10 million years How does that uh, work exactly? well as long as my brain doesn't ossify i'll be okay there, there you go it, it just means everything he says is said in stone <laughs> <laughs> very good steven so my professional of the week, I think I'm ready to announce this, is that Surfing the Nash Tsunami or SurfingNash.com will be starting a second podcast at the end of April. This one targeted more specifically to issues about metabolic disease that are of interest to endocrinologists. And we will have more about who the team is on that and a initial episode date coming in the next couple of weeks. We have signed agreements. We've got all the people that we need on board. I think that's an exciting thing for this, pod, for this podcast. And frankly, thanks to those of you, well, Stephen and Louise and Jorn, and then everybody else who's been a guest on this thing. And then to those of you who listen, because when we started, I mentioned at the time, uh, people assured me that we wouldn't have enough content to go past more than 10 episodes, but that's okay because we wouldn't have an audience to listen to more than 10 anyway. And that was 100, well, 10 was 115 episodes ago. And the audience is four times larger than it was then and in probably five times as many countries. And uh, there are now organizations who want to talk to us, not just about endocrinology, but we're having discussions about a couple of other more targeted podcasts, all somewhere in the fatty liver realm. So to the degree that we can, that, that a rising boat of information lifts all ships, and that when Stephen and I went down this path, it was part of his bigger mission to make a dent in fatty liver disease. This says to me, maybe we're making a dent, maybe we're even about to make a bigger one. So that's my professional, actually, it's probably my personal news for the week, too, because uh, if you tell me I can't run through a wall, I tend to try to figure out how. I kind of feel like this is the wall we have now officially run through. Sorry to end that sentence with a preposition. With that, why don't we go on to the episode? We were originally going to devote this episode to talking about the work that uh, has been done out at the University of Pennsylvania in combining CAR-T and RNA as a way to deal with fibrosis. Now, that work's only been done in animals so far, but extremely exciting. We invited Neil on to comment on that, and then uh, Jonathan Epstein, the author of that paper, unfortunately was unable to make it today. So we're going to try to hit two targets in one episode, which is Scott will start by talking a little bit about that work, and folks will comment on it. And that will, I expect, segue naturally into a conversation on some of Neil's work in single-cell genomics. As a guy who stopped taking a science course after high school, my guess is I'm going to listen and play Traffic Cop, but I'm expecting a fantastic episode, so Scott, floor's yours. Whoa, the pressure's on. I'll do my best. So there have been a series of papers over the last two years that have opened the door to a very exciting new technology for treating fibrosis. To explain it, I need to give you a little bit of background. Uh, there has been efforts for several years now by many groups, but driven in large measure by fantastic scientists at University of Pennsylvania to develop a specialized kind of cell therapy where you program the cell and turn it into a guided missile so that it will seek, find, and destroy specific kinds of liquid tumor cells or leukemias or lymphomas, I think mostly lymphomas. It's an arduous process, but it has saved a number of lives, and there are some patients who are alive over 10 years later. To apply this therapy, the technique requires that investigators take out some white blood cells from the patient who's going to receive the therapy, and then introduce DNA to program them to express a specialized kind of receptor on the cell that ordinarily is not there. And that receptor endows this cell, which is a killing cell, and endows the cell with the ability to home in on its partner on specific cells. And by knowing that there are some specific 
specific type of markers on lymphoma cells, for example, they can design and apply or administer these specialized T lymphocytes to the patient and the T cells or what are called CAR T cells because that stands for chimeric antigen receptor or kind of a hybrid artificial receptor. These cells home in on the tumor cells and destroy them. It's really a guided missile. It's been a transformative in understanding and treating some very specialized kind of cancers. About two years ago, two different groups said, well, if it works for killing cancer cells, maybe we can think about using it to target cells that are making too much scar. And there are two groups that went about this. One I was peripherally involved with was from the laboratory of Scott Lowe and Michelle Satellane at Sloan Kettering here in New York. They were focused on liver. The other was from Jonathan Epstein, who's an exceptional in cardiac or cardiology investigator at Penn. Uh, and both the Epstein and the Lowe groups did something conceptually very similar is they said, let's try out a CAR T cell where we now program the cell to home in, not on a tumor cell, but on the fibrogenic cells in liver, which we know are called stellate cells. And parenthetically, I've been studying those since we first isolated them in 1983 or thereabouts. One of the secrets to this technology is what receptor do we home in on to make sure we capture and kill the right cells and not other cells? And in the case of the low paper, which was published in Nature in 2019, the first author was AMOR, A-M-O-R, they found through informatic analysis that there was a specialized kind of receptor called the urokinase plasminogen activated receptor, which is called UPAR, and they generated or designed this CAR T cell to home in on UPAR expressing cells, which it happens are largely, but not exclusively, a specialized type of activated fibrogenic stellate cells. And what they showed is that if you induce liver injury in a mouse and you administer these UPAR seeking CAR T cells, you can actually deplete the liver of those fibrogenic cells and reduce fibrosis. And at the same time showed that it can actually increase liver function, which raises some very interesting questions about how does fibrosis suppress normal liver function and could the clearance of a subset of those fibrogenic cells actually unmask healthier liver and healthier hepatocytes. So that's example one. Example two was in the Jonathan Epstein lab. They decided to use a similar concept, but in their case, they looked for or they generated CAR T cells that seek and find a cell surface molecule known as FAP1 or fibroblast activating protein 1, which happens to be expressed on a number of cells, but in the heart, which was his interest, it's expressed by related fibrogenic cells to stellate cells. And so conceptually, they did the same thing. They induced heart failure with scarring of the heart using phenylephrine and angiotensin, which are vasoactive mediators. They administered the CAR T cells that were sort of guided missiles, finding the cells expressing FAP1. And as in the liver example, they cleared the FAP1 expressing cells, they reduced the fibrosis, and they improved the heart function. So the conceptual novelty in both of those is the idea of pivoting from a cancer indication to an indication for CAR T where you're trying to deplete a cell that's causing disease that's not a cancer cell. Fast forward another couple of years, and Jonathan Epstein and his group, and uh, I'm just an awestruck admirer, I have no role in these studies, but they did something that was even more clever, and they did it by leveraging not only the CAR T expertise at Penn, but also the now widely appreciated expertise in mRNA technologies. So to digress for a second, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which we've come to know very well as perhaps the two most effective vaccines in the fight against COVID, are mRNA vaccines. So what that means is they're effectively a bag, a membrane, an artificial membrane bag that contains within it the coding sequence of an mRNA so that once it enters the body, that mRNA is used as a template to create protein. And in the case of the COVID-19 vaccine, the mRNA encodes the spike protein, which is the most immunogenic part of the COVID vaccine. So the way those vaccines work is you administer the lipid nanoparticle containing the mRNA. The mRNA is translated into protein in the body, and that protein is expressed and ignites an immune response that uh, provides some or a lot of protection against COVID-19 infection. So once again, uh, Jonathan Epstein leveraged that technology to say, wow, you know, instead of having to take those white blood cells out of the patient or out of the experimental animal, program with DNA that stably expresses a new receptor and then put it back in the animal or in the patient, why don't we just give the instructions for that cell conversion into a killing CAR T cell by administering a lipid nanoparticle that contains the sequence to turn that white blood cell into a specific seeking vessel. So basically all the work is effectively done in the body. So all one has to do in 
principle is administer the lipid nanoparticle just like you would the COVID-19 vaccine. Now the lipid nanoparticle translates protein and finds its way to the T cells and turns the T cell into a killing machine, specifically finding the same FAP1 molecule that they had validated before. And sure enough, when they administer the what they call FAPCAR, because it's the FAP1 CAR T cell, when they administer the FAPCAR, the lipid nanoparticles to mice with the same heart failure and fibrosis, they get the same result. But the advantages here may be obvious, but let me spell them out. Number one is you don't have to take cells out of the animal or eventually the patient. You're programming the cells in the body. So you can literally take an off-the-shelf a lipid nanoparticle construct, in this case, not for COVID-19, but to uh, target CAR T cells, uh, generate CAR T cells. You can literally send it around the way we send around the vaccines for immunization. You could administer it and then let the, the liver and the body generate the CAR T cells, program those CAR T cells inside the body, and then find their way to kill the FAP1 expressing cells. So the one advantage, as I said, is it's off the shelf. The other advantage, which is not trivial, is that if you remember, I said the original CAR T constructs have integrated or DNA, and it's been shown now by uh, Dr. Carl June, who's one of the pioneers in this field, that some of those patients that were administered CAR T cells for lymphoma 10 years ago still have some of those CAR T cells in their body, which is amazing. And of course, it keeps probably suppressing the, or may keep suppressing the lymphomas that it was used to treat. But that also creates a problem because you've got cells that are engineered that are hanging around for a decade or more. The beauty of the FAPCAR or the CAR uh, lipid nanoparticle mRNA approach is that it's transient because mRNA turns to protein. mRNA can't integrate into the genome of the host, and so it will be self-limited. So one could imagine giving a dose, seeing how effective it is, and then choosing a dosing schedule that allows you to kill some of those fibrogenic cells without permanently depleting them from the body or without taking too many out. So really fantastic technology. I think one can envision that this kind of mRNA technology for CAR T cells can also be applied to other diseases where there's a specific cell type. It could be an autoimmune disease. It could be other kinds of diseases where a specialized type of cell is wreaking havoc, and then you can zero in on it uh, by administering a lipid nanoparticle CAR T and assessing the response without conferring a permanent implantation of an engineered cell. So I'm super excited about this technology and hats off to the Penn Group that again combined three world-class technologies, the CAR T, the lipid nanoparticle, and the mRNA technology, and they packaged it into a, a whole revolutionary new approach. Clearly a lot of work to be done, needs to be validated by other investigators and other groups, it needs to show that it's safe. There is, of course, a long path towards getting this into patients and could be fraud and no guarantees. But conceptually and in terms of their first proof of principle, it's one of the most exciting things I've seen come around in a very long time. So, Scott, thank you. Your typically elegant, eloquent, and purely concise description of what's a pretty extraordinary piece of work. As I was listening to you, one of the reactions I had was for years when you drove it north out of New Pennsylvania to Newark Airport, there was a billboard just before you got there from Prudential that said the first 150-year-old in history has already been born. And listening to that sequence of technology, you start to understand how people could get there in, in a way that we might not have previously. Yeah, particularly as the, I didn't say it in, in specifics, but the, the Scott Lowe paper was focused on a marker that conferred senescence or old age on specific stellate cells. So your suggestion is actually more apt than you may have realized because one could imagine clearing senescent cells on an ongoing basis. Pretty cool stuff. And I'm not sure I want to live 150 years and I don't think I will, but that's a different discussion. <laughs> It is a different discussion. You know, my quick first comment is, Scott, thank you again for uh, summarizing this so brilliantly. And I think you touched a very important point of the safety aspect. You built the argument that mRNA technologies might be more suitable because they have a more temporary or maybe more limited effect, which might be beneficial. On the other hand, the long-term effects in diseases like cancer or metabolic traits could be useful to have a baseline activity to suppress the ongoing metabolic inflammation. So case well built. There are arguments to study both approaches in these chronically ill patients. And uh, of course, many things uh, need to be saved. Since we have Neil on here, this is really the time to switch and ask him as a clinician scientist, as I am the same seat as you are, Neil. Of course, I'm, I'm wondering which cells to target or which conditions to address. And I think this is where we can hand over or at least uh, get your impression on here too, because you've seen these changes in single cells and deliver with your technology. And I think uh, this will be very useful in this context. So, so you are before before Neil does that, I totally agree. There's one comment I would like to make about safety, given that you brought it up. The biggest problem with CAR-T and lymphoma right now is the high presence of cytokine response.
month. In fact, depending upon what paper you read, somewhere between 12 and 20 percent of all patients have a level three or higher cytokine response storm as a side effect of CAR-T therapy, which is why they are put in hospitals. You have to be certified by the manufacturer or otherwise to be able to administer CAR-T. So it's rare and exceptionally expensive. And even then, as I say, 12 to 20 percent level three cytokine response, which is really inhibiting use. That's the real downside of having the cells stick around in the body, even for a few days, forget for a few months. And in fact, virtually all the work that you see being done in oncology right now in CAR-T is on how do we minimize cytokine storm response. So if this is a solution to that problem, then it will be, it's not something you see in hepatology, but you do in some of the places I've worked and it will be a big help going forward for, for that reason. It's a great point. I actually just don't know if the FAPCAR mRNA or the mRNA CAR-T is less prone to cytokine storm. I think that's obviously something people are going to need to sort out. Maybe one of you guys know better than me the pathogenesis of that cytokine storm, but there's always a very long road as well. And I think the other key, which again funnels back to Neil's expertise, is what cell type and what receptors on those cells do you hone in on or do you do more than one and how do you use single cell genomics to help you sort through that complex question? And having made that one point about safety, I think that's exactly right. You're an and Scott. Neil, your floor. Thanks. Just to reiterate, Scott, that was a, a fantastic summary of, of all that technology. I, yeah, I just love the way you can take something and just make it incredibly understandable straight away. So on the back of that, and as, as Jorn was saying as well, this is a classic example of, you know, people talk about the best research is the research that actually then opens a thousand questions and as we're all saying how do you harness and leverage this technology onto the next stage of really exciting therapeutic potential as, as Scott was saying I think it feeds in lots of ways as as we're all on the same page here about how we can use other technologies to help make precision medicine a reality I mean one of the things we face in fibrosis and it always makes me smile talking about this because Scott's been researching this you know longer than any of us but I think hitting a single target is super challenging in fibrosis it's so evolutionarily conserved it'll wound heal wherever possible in the end so you know when we're talking about this new technological approach as Scott alluded to I think it's really fun to think about combinatorial therapy so the fi liver fibrosis is, is getting into that more and by that I mean in standard practice like combinations of small molecule approaches whether they'll be successful in the end none of us really know but it would be very exciting to think about even multimodality combinatorial therapies. So, you know, not even just CAR-T or, or son or daughter of CAR-T, but combining that with other hits to the fibrotic process. So it's a really exciting time in fibrosis in general and in the liver. And this type of technology, where as Scott says, you can precisely fire an antifibrotic potentially exactly where you need it is incredibly exciting. I think the other thing we need to think about is organ specificity. And it comes back to the points made earlier by Scott and Yarn about using technologies like single cell to, to shine a bright light on how much specificity is attainable. You know, the holy grail would be, for example, scar forming mesenchymal cells, say in the liver, Plus, if you could understand more about how epithelial injury drives uh, the fibrotic process, and then your ideal would be to restrict that treatment to the liver. Now, that's a heck of a wish list, I know, but I think we would all agree we're getting closer to those types of treatments where you have local deployment of a therapy that may be organ-specific. And I'm going to say this as an academic, but the more we understand how the clock works, the more we know about the molecular mechanisms and the, the key targets, the easier, in inverted commas, this should get. And that's getting away from all the potential pitfalls with implementing these therapies in patients. But in terms of precision, if we can if we can really hone down on what we think the key targets are, using all these technologies such as single cell, I think it's it's going to be a really, really exciting new chapter. Yeah, thanks for, for explaining that, Scott. Brilliant as always. You know, to me, as I sit here and listen to this and I think about drug development and fatty liver, I feel like I'm at an archaeological dig site where we know there's something down there because we found the very tip of it and we're starting to take our brushes and our little instruments and start to whittle away at the dirt and expose what's really underneath and I feel like we're just at the very tip of that archaeological dig and yet we're trying to drive therapeutics to manipulate the liver disease without fully
really understanding or appreciating what we're dealing with. And as I listen to Scott speak and then you add on, I think about where we are with fibrosis improvement in the field of NASH. And even with our best therapies, we're still scratching the surface on leaving a big fat dent on the planet in the name of liver fibrosis relative to NASH. And what, so I guess my question is, what can we take from what we've learned today and apply it towards drug development and NASH in the broader scope of targeting specific mechanism? Because one of the things we've done is said, look, if you get rid of the fat, the liver should take care of itself. And the idea is relatively simplistic, but we've learned that from hepatitis C, clearance of C, allowing the liver time to regenerate, suppressing the B, treating the autoimmune with steroids, putting it in remission, and then stepping back and letting the liver deal with the remnants of the collagen deposition. In NASH, my suspicion is it's a little more complicated than that, but I would love to have uh, either you or Scott uh, uh, weigh in on, on where you see this going. And if there is some role in CAR-T therapy in NASH, to me, the, the vision would be taking a pretty advanced patient and bringing them back from the edge of the cliff, maybe induction therapy, and then transitioning to something more metabolic. Yeah, I think those are all excellent points, Stephen. And, and, you know, genuinely, I agree with every point you made there. I think the sweet spot potentially for us, as you're saying, is to be able to manipulate F3, F4 type fibrosis. And just for people listening, we grade fibrosis from F0 to F4, and F4 is cirrhosis or end stage scarring. And we know that if we can manipulate people at F3, F4 stage, then we can reduce the clinical complications, which at the end of the day are what we're all about with clinical science. So, it reduces your risk of death and liver cancer and a long list of things if we could actually manipulate F3, F4. I really like your idea, Steve, about manipulating fibrosis and then also coming along with a metabolic tweak. It'll be more than a tweak, perhaps, to stop progression of disease. But again, I think it does come back to, and I agree with you about these are exciting technologies, but we really need a roadmap about what the most sensible approach will be in terms of, of where we direct therapies. And, you know, I, I'm a firm believer and we need more information. We need lots of information. The other thing that we don't have yet as a community, but it'll come and it'll come fairly soon, is single cell resolution information across fibrosis progression. And that's going to be super important. And just in terms of the simple question of do the targets change with progression? And we don't know that yet as a community. You'd almost eat your hat if they don't, but clearly that's a key piece of information to, to obtain. Um, Scott, sorry, I'll, I'll let you come in as well. No, I I, I quite agree, Neil. And just to spell it out, you know, we know that NASH primarily starts in hepatocytes and the accumulation of fat. Now, I'll make a point I've made in previous podcasts, which is that most patients with fat in the liver never get NASH. And so what we need to start with as the drivers is what distinguishes those fatty livers that also go on to accumulate inflammation and cell damage. But the point is that that's really driving the stellate cells to make fibrosis. So I quite agree with Neil and Steve that you certainly can clear fibrogenic cells, but unless you're turning off the faucet of inflammation and cell damage that's upstream of that, if you will, you're paddling upstream. So I, I think it could be sequential, it could be both. I mean, these are all hand-waving, but you know, hopeful thoughts about uh, how we can integrate a cell-based therapy to clear specific cells, in this case, stellate cells, and integrate it with a long-term strategy to suppress disease recurrence or disease progression. I, one other thought I had, Neil, and I wonder if you thought about it, is you've been a master and a leader in defining the individual cell genomes, that's what single cell sequencing is in, in human and rodent liver. What about using single cell technologies to assess how the liver responds to a therapy? Because we think we know, we give a molecule, we think it's blocking this pathway in this cell, but we never really know. And it struck me as you were speaking, and I hadn't thought about it before, how informative would it be to actually dig just as deep to define how each cell type is responding to a medical or a small molecule therapy by assessing the individual cell genome. Any thoughts about that, Neil? Yeah, I absolutely agree. And it's something we've been thinking about over here in Edinburgh and how we could get at that. So what we've been trying to do is optimize protocols for garnering single cell resolution data from needle biopsies, because unless you see otherwise, 
The only way I can really think we can get at that is through serial biopsies, needle biopsies in, in the context of a clinical trial, as you're saying. But absolutely, I think that could be a cool deployment of this technology. And, and when I say cool, I don't mean it glibly. I think for the reasons you've cited, really informative, because that's a major issue, as, as you know far better than I. What are your actual readouts in these clinical trials? How do you in a human assess efficacy of even mode of action? And I think it would be really, really powerful potential if we could do that. Now, the problem in some ways is we'd all love if we could get molecular level readouts without putting a needle in someone, but I ain't come up with anything smart on that front as yet and may never do. But, you know, I can't I can't really think, other than, say, peripheral blood, where we could do single cell on that, but it's more of a surrogate readout. It's not going to be as good as tissue. But to do that, I've been thinking a lot about whether we could do it without with tissue, but I think we'd be using needle biopsies, which are not, as you can imagine, trivial in terms of trying to extract that type the data from a very small piece of liver. It's possible. I think we're getting there with that approach, but it's not It's not easy. So, first of all, you could at least establish proof of principle using a rodent model where you have ample access to tissue, but ultimately you are smart and right to go to the human tissue. But of course, then you're also potentially confounded by the sampling variability that we know has bedeviled the field since the very beginning, because even if you capture cells and you get single cell sequences, are they the same as the sequences you might have gotten if you moved the needle biopsy or the biopsy needle a, a millimeter or a centimeter away. Yeah, fully agree. That's exactly what I was going to ask, Scott, you know, the heterogeneity issue. So you were, you were a step ahead of me there. The other thing I was going to say, though, uh, to Neil's point is we do phase 2B studies all the time where you have to have paired liver biopsies, biopsy to get in, biopsy to get out. Just if we were to chase that thought a little bit further, how much tissue would you need? Does it need to be, can it, uh, obviously you probably want it before it's paraffin embedded. So how do we operationally, how would we do that? Because we, we potentially could move in that direction relatively quickly. Yeah. So Steve, what I'd say on that front so far, and this is you know, I'm at pains to say this is just our experience. There, there will almost certainly not even almost say, I'm sure there are groups around the world trying to optimize this. And so I'll just tell you about our experience. So in direct answer to your question, the ideal, if it were possible, would be at that time of biopsy is, and you probably know what I'm going to say here, which is one core goes to pathology, standard, formalin, fixed, etc. One core goes in its entirety for single cell transcriptomics. And the reason I say that is because we've tried half needle biopsies, one to FFP, one to single cell genomics, but we've really found that unsurprisingly, the more tissue we can commit to the single cell transcriptome side of things, the better. The other thing is size. So that's just flash frozen? Yeah, exactly. And then size of biopsy is, is another key thing. Some centers use a big needle, some use smaller needles, and there's no doubt, unsurprisingly, if you get a nice big core, that helps. I think that's not an insurmountable operational endeavor. Most of our liver biopsies are done by interventional radiologists. They have no issue making more than one pass. One goes to formalin, one goes flash frozen, and gets shipped over. So I think that's a doable proposition if we wanted to consider that. At least as a as you were mentioning, uh, Scott, as proof of concept, just to try to understand response response, what's activating, what's down-regulating, yeah. you know, what's actually being affected by therapy. The other thing just to dial in here as well, and again, you guys will have, I'm sure, thought of these approaches as well, but a spatial transcriptomics matures and becomes richer, higher resolution. The spot size and the matrices that they use for spatial transcriptomics improves. That's another possibility here, Steve, in terms of literally looking in tissue. Now, there are kits available to do this on FFPE tissue already, the resolution's not, in my opinion, good enough yet, and the companies are aware of that. That's why the resolution's coming down. But that is another option here for intraclinical trial readouts of, of efficacy, potentially. And I think that is such a hot field that that may be actually the, the way this matures in the coming years. So you're talking about spatial transcriptomics, where you can look at the tissue and the cells just as they are in the liver and see where the genes are being expressed and overlay that with cell-specific markers. And I think your colleague Prakash, your former 
trainee has a beautiful slide looking at just that analogy with the blender, which um, you may want to even uh, describe because I think it's so apt. Yes, yeah. So that's that's a favorite favorite slide in in single cell world. Is just how we've gone resolution wise from in the old days of when we took tissue and just mashed it up together and read out all the RNA sequence from that. It's like a bunch of fruit in a blender and and blended up just into a, a smoothie. And then the next analogy is moving on from that. You can see what the individual fruit in the smoothie are. So it might be grapes and bananas and kiwi fruit. But then the next step is seeing its beautiful in situness on the top of a, a lovely tart where you can see spatially where the grapes are relative to the kiwi fruit relative to the slices of banana. And so the, the real buzz about spatial transcriptomics is preservation of in situ relationships and, and molecular signals because you are literally taking a barcode approach where you anneal the tissue to an array and it's all individually barcoded spots. So the Clever Informatics team can work out exactly where that gene expression was on that tissue section. So you can imagine this is incredibly exciting technology across cancer, across fibrosis, name your area of biomedicine. And a bit like radiology does, the tech is driving this field very, very rapidly. So this is an area I think is only going to get bigger and, and more exciting. So, Neil, thanks. That was a, and Scott, the, between the request for a blender slide and the discussion of the blender slide, that was a really, and your original statement, Scott, that was a really helpful way to help folks who might have heard the two-word phrase spatial transcriptomics, but not had a real feel for what it was, get that. It might not be a bad thing, if you can, to go back through a couple of the other technologies that you're working with now, where people might have heard the buzzwords, but not understand exactly how it works, and share a little bit of that. Sure, no problem, Roger. So, yeah, probably nearly 10 years ago, the first sort of single cell transcriptomes came on the scene, and quite rightly, I think one of the early Nature papers was something like 75 or 76 cells. So it was a big tech breakthrough where you could measure gene expression within individual cells and say with high confidence that a certain gene data set of expression of genes came from a specific cell. So the big step change here was literally the ability to take a set of gene expression and understand with precision exactly which cell expressed which genes. Because in older times when we took whole tissue of liver and mushed it up and measured all the gene expression, you could estimate and guess where certain genes came from, like albumin, we know are is made in hepatocytes, but lots of the genes you had no feel for exactly which cells were expressing those genes. And so single cell genomics really revolutionized that. And then it's it's iterated quickly. So the studies around 2015, when I started that in my group, we were having to use 384 well plates, and you would maybe by attrition only get 300 cell transcriptomes out of an entire plate, which was around converting it into dollars, around 8,000 bucks a plate, very expensive, low throughput. Then companies like 10x genomics obviously saw an opportunity and developed high throughput droplet based systems which are very very neat so you feed your single cell suspension in the cell then merges into a specialized droplet that's lipid based and within that are all the goodies to both break down the cell membrane release all the messenger rna and then reverse transcribe that into cdna with a barcode so then out the far side of that that gets sequenced as a cdna library and then informaticians through the barcoding system can tell you exactly which gene was expressed in which individual cell. So high throughput single cell pushed it all on even faster and many a wet lab group, you know, bought the 10X system and it's very widely used now. And then beyond that, what's getting really exciting is different flavors of, of that. So single nuclei uh, sequencing is something that we use and, and Scott's lab uses and that has a number of advantages including you can get the same type of information but from frozen tissue. So whole cell, single cell does not tend to give great data at all from a frozen piece of tissue. Whereas a nuclei prep and then doing single nuclei sequencing, you actually can get very rich data. And so it works on a number of levels. People can look into their old biobanks and sequence tissue they've had in the freezer for years. You can collaborate with groups all around the world and send each other frozen bits of tissue. So it opens all that up. And the data is actually very good. And specifically in the liver, it also opens up hepatocytes, 
which are very tricky to sequence as whole cells with a 10x system. So lots of advantages nuke And then beyond that, the other exciting development is multimodal readouts from the same cell. So for example, you can now read out the epigenome with approaches like atax from the same cell you've read out the mRNA or transcriptome. So you can get a feel for what in the chromatin in terms of enhancers, repressors, etc., what transcription factors might be regulating the whole transcriptome of the same cell. So again, this is exciting for potential therapeutic development, but also just allows us to understand even more about the biology of cell state and what regulates cell state. And I think that's another really exciting area within the field about, for a long time, understandably, we pigeonholed cells into individual lineages. But it's clear that even within a lineage, there are subpopulations, and beyond that, there are cell states within that population or subpopulation. So the multimodal readouts are, are again, something that's coming over the horizon fast. Single cell proteomics, yeah, it's just, it's really blossoming. Fascinating just to listen, Neil. Congratulations. I guess my question or what I'm thinking is, how much do individuals differ? Now, if you look at different patients and you do single cells, what is the impact of individual characteristics and, and how much is the overlaying disease, you know, that we could treat as a physician? Because certain, I guess, individual traits are difficult to tackle with therapy. So I, I have you, straight out question, have you had the opportunity to look and, and get some impression on how much individual variation there is between individuals? It's, it's a really good point, Jorn. And to, to tackle that, essentially what we've been doing with my group over the last two, three years now is building up the end. Now, you know, that's a very intellectually lazy thing to say, but I, I say it for a reason. And precisely because you said humans are, are very different, they're very varied, they are the opposite of a box of inbred mice. We've basically been going at it by increasing the end as much as possible to try and get a feel for that variability. What I will say is some of our cohorts in certain diseases are up around the 40 mark now, and it's actually quite remarkable how in certain cell lineages the commonality there is across patients. Now, clearly, if you're dealing with explant data, and that by explant, I know people on the call know this, but for anybody listening, so when we talk about an explant, what we mean is the diseased liver that's come out of a patient at the time of transplant. So explant livers tend to be very much end-stage disease, so perhaps the heterogeneity is reduced you know, in that cohort because they're end-stage. I think it'll be interesting to see whether the error bars, if you like, get even bigger when we step into you know, early-stage NASH or progressing NASH, for example, where it might get even more variable. But so far, we've been, in a nice way, quite surprised at actually how congruent some of the data is in these big end data sets. Which is reassuring because it means you can use it to actually identify drug targets for treatment. Yeah, and we had a, a nice a nice little vignette. About a month ago, one of my fellows, Sebastian, we sequenced that NASH liver. In essence, we, for whatever reason, Bass hadn't written down at the time what the fibrosis and steatosis grading was by the pathologist. So for fun, before he went back to the hospital to garner that information, he tried to predict from what we've seen so far what stage it was. And of course, this is an N, an N of 1, and we'll all laugh, but he, was, he actually predicted the F stage with accuracy from the single cell data set. Now, that's just an N of 1, but it's, it's quite exciting to think about it in terms of diagnostics and also front-end binning of people appropriately into the front-end of clinical trials. I think that's another potential real strength area of this technology is to accurately stratify people um, and not have this heterogeneous mass of patients going in at the front end of a given clinical trial. So potentially lots of applications. Yeah, I'm really glad you said that because there are lots of potential reasons why no NASH drug is doing well in most patients. Even the ones that look promising affect typically a minority. In the case of the intercept trial, I think it was 23% of the treated. I think in the semaglutide, it was somewhere in the 40-50%. Stephen knows this better. But the point is, why can't we improve every patient with NASH if we have a good drug? And one of the answers may be that not every patient with NASH is the same. Some of them may have different ways that they got to the appearance that we see under the microscope, and some of them may have different ways they respond to the drug. So, you know, digging really deep, as you're describing, Neil, offers the prospect of enriching clinical trials based on uh, our ability to standardize features of the biopsy that are more likely to confer responsiveness to a drug. Exactly. And then, as you say, 
diagnosis, but that potentially feeds into properly tailored therapy. Yeah, exactly. Neil, can I just ask, you were talking about the explant there. Do you use uh, non-beating donors? We use them for kidney transplants, for example. So the organs that aren't used but could be harvested for clinical research like you're describing, do you use those type of organs or is it purely the explant at the moment? And would that be a potential revenue of organs that you could try these data on? It's a really, really good point, Lee. So, so the short answer to your question is we don't, we tend to use uh, essentially explants or needle biopsies or our healthy, and this is an interesting one that you know you can debate up hill and down dale about what's a healthy human liver. Because our best source of healthy human liver in Edinburgh is, for example, patients undergoing resection for colorectal metastasis. And so we take an area of liver distal to the, the tumour site. But of course, those patients have commonly, say, a few months ago had chemotherapy. And what is a normal human liver? And you could argue they're not, they're clearly not an entirely healthy liver. But getting healthy liver tissue, as you can imagine, is very, very challenging. Challenging. So it's a very interesting point you make, and it's something we've talked a bit about, but I think certainly in Edinburgh we could maximise that potential pipeline. The other thing that I think is interesting that we've learned over the last few years, coming back to this point about what is healthy. Now, I live in Scotland. It's very much a kind of typical Western world diet. People entirely reasonably enjoy a drink now and again, and by that I mean alcohol. So when we've actually gone trying to find cases of normal human liver, it's not infrequent that they of F1 or F2 or even F3 fibrosis incidentally. So I think that's the other thing for us all to bear in mind that people talk about aging and senescence absolutely appropriately but the more I kind of work in hepatology in this area and Scott's probably thought this for years and Steve too but once you get above a certain age the liver's just got a bit of wear and tear you know it's been doing its best for five six seven decades it's interesting if you look at some ITU series of autopsy the number of people who have a cirrhotic liver that was undiagnosed who are elderly who die in ITU is something else is quite remarkable so I think we need to be careful and it comes back to Jorn's point about being careful in, in the, the human arena as to you know we might talk about normal liver but a 30 year old's liver's going to be quite different from a 70 year old even though they're both said to have normal liver function so it's just another variable I think we all need to as a community bear in mind and as we build up the data sets across the board with all the groups around the world I think it'll be really fun to start to coalesce it into hopefully a meaningful you know to use the parlance from the human cell atlas but a meaningful map of normal liver. I'll, I'll tell you a little anecdote Neil which you probably appreciate we had one purportedly normal liver from a resection for a patient with a neuroendocrine tumor, pathologist told us histologically the tissue which we had captured far away from the tumor was normal. When we did single cell seek, we found a huge neuroendocrine cell population. So, you know, what you see under the eye is not as discriminating as what you learn when you sequence every cell in the tissue. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, amazing. So we're getting towards the bottom of an hour of the podcast, which is normally the time we start to wrap up. Before we do that, Stephen, do you have anything you want to add or questions or a closing thought? No, I think this has been tremendously helpful. It's been fascinating to hear the dialogue between Neil and Scott and questions that have, have been generated as a result of that. I think this is, we should do this more often. This idea, this bantering back and forth of knowledge, I think just leads to more questions. As you mentioned earlier, Neil, you know, new research generating a thousand questions is good research. And for a guy that's purely clinical like me to hear what's happening at the bench and at a, a translational level just makes me think about how we can apply that clinically. And it may not be today, it may be 10 years from now, but we got to begin to start thinking about that. So again, thank you for coming on for all the awesome work that you're doing. And uh, please uh, come back and tell us more about all the fascinating things that uh, are happening with single cell uh, genomics and transcriptomics as well. Thanks very much, Steve, for, for all your kind words. And it, I have to say, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, chatting with everybody. It just reminds me once again how much I can't wait for when we can all meet up in person at things and do exactly this, but in the same room. Well, Easel's just a couple months away, so we're getting there. Yeah, absolutely. And Scott, again, congratulations on your award. You're, it's well-earned. Certainly, uh, you know, you, you're kind contributions to the field are legendary and, and you're a, a giant. So thank you for coming on a second time with us today. Always happy to come back. It was a pleasure. And thank you again for that. Thank you. Uh, I think we all want to make a difference. One of the nicest things about an award like this 
is your colleagues who know you best from your institution tell you, yeah, you made a difference. And so I'm very humbled and grateful. Thanks. Well, we're going to tell several hundred thousand listeners that you've made a difference. Let me line up next to my friend Steve and say that if you guys want to come back three or four times a year and just make this a regular part of the rotation, I'd be delighted because I learned so much listening to you folks. And if, if, if you don't come talk about it, nobody else is going to, frankly. If you're having fun, Neil, if you're having fun, Scott, we'll, we'll do this every three months and just kind of open it up and say, what's going on? And let you guys and let you guys go. And that would be fantastic. Okay. Uh, for those who can't see, because this is an audio recording, that was two thumbs up, actually three thumbs up, two from Scott, one from Neil. But the Scots tend to be more restrained in moments like this. So Scott just gave us, uh, Neil gave us one more thumbs up. We're now at four. Louise added one for five. Yorn's being really bashful about this. And we can't see Scott, but I'm going to assume it's unanimous. Can I just ask one question, uh, more in relation to the earlier part? Because it was strange. I was thinking the same thing when Scott talked about prevention. We don't understand. One in ten alcoholics will get cirrhosis and the other nine won't. And that excitement about being able to find out upstream what we're changing or what, what doesn't work and what does work. But what really are the risks? Is there a risk of if we target regeneration that we can over-regenerate the liver with new tissue and therefore actually increase fibrosis and and create the problem we're trying to solve? Mm, great question, Louise, and I'll answer it a little bit differently. First of all, we don't understand the magic of regeneration. How is it you can take two-thirds of a liver, remove it surgically, put it in a recipient, and both the recipient liver in the new host and the original remnant liver in the donor both grow to full size and then stop? How do we know? I mean, well, how does it know? It's, it's, it's absolutely miraculous. And so what you're asking is, could it not stop? And rather than worry about it growing too much uh, within the the space, what I do worry about is that that growth can be translated into growth of cancer cells. So that's the tightrope we walk when we're looking for therapies that improve regeneration is we want to basically harness pathways that make the cells healthier, but don't overexcite them to grow to the point where they may evolve into a cancer. And that's a very naive, simplistic description, but a lot of the growth signals that enhance regeneration in principle are also implicated in liver cancer. So we need to really tread that line very, very carefully. I said, Suspect Neil agrees. I do, I do, and also I would layer on, and you know, the funny thing here, Louise, is I'm actually going to quote Scott further here because I remember him giving this talk a couple of years ago, or maybe pre-pandemic. But what, what Scott was highlighting also in this talk was it's really interesting the data that we're seeing where by manipulating the scar you might concomitantly drive regeneration, and we don't understand that. I mean, you know, why melting scar then translates to actually the liver regenerates even more. Now, you may say the liver is in general happier because it has less scar, but there's some phenomenon going on whereby treating the scar actually makes the liver regenerate more. So we're all biased because we're liver liver interested folks, but this incredible plasticity of the liver. And that's where you could argue we should be some of the biggest optimists in, in the fibrosis field because of the plasticity of this organ versus, you know, other organs. But it's a really cool interrelationship. And, and I think the question you asked was, was a really good one about the regenerative side of things. Some people would say if you can drive regeneration, it's antifibrotic. So, you know, the holy grail would be in, in someone with bad fibrosis would be to melt away a lot of the scar so you get restitution of normal architecture and it allows the liver to do its thing better and also drive hepatocyte growth to increase parenchymal function. If we could do these things, we know that cirrhotic patients, as you know extremely well, are far more prone to sepsis. Now, why is that? And it's probably in some way part to do with all this alternative blood flow through the liver with all scarring and the immune surveillance ain't what it was when the liver was normal. So the number of benefits that the patient could accrue from trying to get back to this more normal architecture are vast. And it's a really interesting area, really interesting and something Scott and I have, have talked about in the past. And I think it needs a lot more study. And, and like you're saying, not focusing just on melt and scar, but what other beneficial effects might that drive, but also coming at it from the regenerative side. First of all, I want to thank, as we wrap up, I want to thank Thank uh, everybody. But Scott and Neil, you know, you have these days in your life where you feel like you walk through a door at opening, you see the world differently than you did the day before. I've had that experience in the last hour and a half. So thank you. Scott, congratulations again. I don't think you're going to get tired of hearing this one, <laughs> at least no, not, not, in the, not in the near future, for a well-deserved and totally appropriate lifetime award. Right. We all believe you made a difference. It's great that your colleagues see it as well. Well, each of you have as well, for sure. We're, we're all trying in our, hum in our humble ways. And thank you. My wrap-up question really is to Scott and Neil and, and Jorn and Louis 
please finesse this however you like. The work that you're doing right now, where is the next place that you see it making a difference in terms of uh, where the rubber is going to meet the road in terms of actual treatment of patients? Where do, where do you think that's likely to happen next and what's it likely to look like? Well, as, as Neil knows, we're very interested in developing the right treatment for the right cell at the right time in the history of the disease. And I'll just leave it at that. So we, we think we're beginning to appreciate that a target that's useful in a patient who has mild fibrosis or tractable may not be as appealing in late fibrosis. And so we're thinking a lot about that. We also think a lot about the point that Neil made, and I'm flattered that you remembered, but it, it's so such a powerful natural experiment where you get rid of the scar and suddenly the liver starts regenerating or you start stimulating regeneration and the scar melts away. And I can't say we have any major insights, but it's worth seeing what's in front of us and asking the obvious question is, how does that all communicate? And so those are the kinds of questions we're tackling. Yeah, I would say very, very similar, Roger, and Scott's group's doing as well, using these cutting edge technologies, which I'm at pains to say, this is the opposite of just employing cutting edge technology for for its sake. You know, these technologies are, are shining lights on the biology or pathobiology underpinning these diseases in a way that we've, Scott's you know, worked in this field for a long time and I'm sure he'd agree with a resolution we just wasn't possible before. So it's incredibly exciting. It's almost overwhelming at times, the amount of information that this is yielding. But my goodness, it's a lot of fun going through it, trying to, to find the best angles for therapies for patients. I agree. And I, I would say that Neil is one of the few and certainly among the most adept at putting complex information and data sets into a context that actually clarifies human disease and human liver disease in his case. So at the end of the day, you got to understand the biology and the disease context in which that biology is operating. So it really takes a very broad skill set and a, a seasoned perspective like uh, Neil has to make sense of it all. Yeah, and to loop it back to drug development, I think where I do see this technology sit is to really decipher the patients that do respond or not. I guess this is what Scott highlighted uh, at looking at the the right patients to treat, but maybe also understanding why some non-respond and why some don't respond. It's even beyond pathophysiology. It's the individualized pathophysiology because we are all well aware that not everybody responds alike to the same patient, in particular in a multifaceted disease as non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And just to round it up from a clinical perspective, Neil, you mentioned the, the regression of SCAR and Scott discussed this. And I had a patient today in clinics and I read my uh, my report 10, day, 10 years back. Uh, he had hepatitis B associated compensated cirrhosis. I did uh, do non-invasive tests today and his uh, transit elastography read out for 8.5, which I'm convinced uh, he's non-cirrhotic anymore. And, and, and that's the reality. We can revert this. And it's, of course, very important that we understand uh, how this could be further augmented. I mean, uh, nuke therapy for HPV is, is a very specific treatment and a whole different story, but for sure, a, a blue pause to, to understand that cirrhosis is revertible. Yeah, it's a great point, you know, a great point. And this is the thing, as you highlight, we see it in front of our eyes. You know, this this is far from sort of preclinical experimental readouts. This is seeing it in patients, which which is fantastic and gives us all hope that we can actually make impact in, in for example, non I mean, viral liver disease has been a wonderful success story, but has also been really exciting for people like me who work in non-viral disease to see that actually, if we give the livers a chance, they're going to do quite a lot of it on their own. Louise, go ahead. I think I echo a little bit of what Jean was just saying there. The, and I've seen a lot of patients recently with this catch-up that have regressed from the hepatitis C post-antiviral therapy, which is always reassuring. But also it's about finding people earlier so that we can stabilise their disease with technologies like this potentially in the future. For those who are in the middle ground, F3, early F4, that holding these patients stable because these patients will provide a wealth of the research. They will be the subjects. They will be the willing volunteers to do these clinical trials and be prepared to undergo biopsy because they are they have potential exciting outcomes that's the earlier we diagnose, the slower we can get the diseases to progress and the more we can put in the lifestyle and care management that helps these patients stabilise long enough to get them to that stage for these exciting treatments. Absolutely echo that, Louise. I think it's a great point. The other thing, just for kicks a bit further to what you were saying, I was chatting to someone the other day, you know, Roger, when we talk about absolute blue sky thinking and they were imaging guys and I was talking to them about in some way trying to measure whole transcriptome gene expression 
with an imaging modality. We were deliberately just have an absolute open book kick around of that as a potential uh, modality. And the funny thing was, in a great way, at the far end of the discussion, it didn't seem like Saturn by the end of the discussion. And, you know, if we could get towards high-plex molecular diagnosis in a non-invasive way, that would, again, take us all on in lots of different ways once more. So medicine moves really fast, science moves even faster. But, yeah, I think all, all of us on this call are of a similar mind of we just remain open-minded and see where it takes us. And um, Some of the stuff is fantastic. Let me tell you one of the doors that opened to me, and Scott kind of touched on this a minute ago. On our more typical episodes, when we're closer to uh, clinical treatment and drug development than we are today, we talk a lot about the longitudinalization of the disease. In fact, we talk about longitudinal combination therapy, the idea that what you would want to do uh, for an F4 patient and an F2 patient might be very different. But we're talking about entirely practical issues. The idea that large molecule biologics are going to be more expensive than small molecule pills. The idea that side effects will have something to do with the dose administration, all that. So that you might, over time, manage the patient if you're going to regress disease or stabilize disease for some combination of cost and tolerability. You're talking about longitudinal from a whole different direction. The idea that the targets change. And then there's the interesting question to me, Scott, if, if the target is what it is at F2 and you don't treat it at F2 and you go on a compensated cirrhosis and somehow regress the patient back to F2, are you going to get back to the same target? I mean, right, one, of, one of the things we know is that when you take people out of cirrhosis, you can regress you can regress some elements of it, but other elements are never going to go back to where they were. Well, there, there actually is some biology, if I can interpose. You got a second, Rod? Oh, absolutely. So, uh, you know, there's been beautiful studies originally by Robert Schwabe and Tatiana Kisileva, and some of that is now being carried on in my own group uh, by very talented young faculty that all show that, you know, when liver fibrosis regresses and the liver doesn't need activated stellate cells to make scar, that some of them die. And one of Neil's former mentors was instrumental in uncovering that, John Iredale. But some of them just regress or inactivate. And those inactivated stellate cells are somewhere in between a truly quiescent stellate cell and one that's totally activated. So it's really, your, your question is really intriguing because it could well be that the now what we want to target when they regress to F2 is a repertoire of targets that characterize the inactivated stellate cell and not the one that's never been activated. And they may be different. They're certainly different epigenetically. I think we know that. So with that, here's my closing comment. As I've been listening, here's what I realized. I, I would like you two gentlemen, in fact, everybody on this call, but certainly you two gentlemen, to agree not the week after every major conference when we do the immediate wrap-up of, of the clinicals, but the week after that, the second week after EASL, the second week after ASLD, maybe second week after Paris Nash, we'll see what else, to come on and talk about the meta of what we just heard and how it relates to the kinds of things we've been talking about today. Because I, I think that would be exactly the right time and exactly the right question to keep this dialogue going and to allow what we're hearing at all different levels to inform the work you guys are doing and seeing. So if you're in for it, I'm going to send out invites. I just think those will be some of our best episodes of the year, like this is. Well, I certainly learned a lot, so I'm up for that. Yeah, and I, I certainly learned a lot, so ditto, I'm up for that. Okay, so then to everybody who's listening, please make a note. We will send out audience invitations. I know that there were actually a couple of people who wrote me during this episode who said, I couldn't make it for the beginning, but are you still going? Because if these guys are still talking, I want to hear what they have to say. Well, I actually admitted to the audience mid-episode. I will be back with the business report in a couple of minutes. We will be back next week with a equal and also important but very different kind of episode previewing the innovations in NAFL Care Workshop in Barcelona in May. Uh, Scott, thank you so much and congratulations. Neil, um, I'm thrilled to have you with us and I'm glad you want to come back because I watch your talks and conferences with my jaw agape and um, it's easy. It, it, I can't keep it agape now because people actually see me, but mentally the process is there. So come, come, you guys come frequently. It's been great. Jorn, Louise, thanks. Audience, I'll be back. And now for the Season 3, Episode 17 Business Report. Starting off for our Ukrainian friends and colleagues, Slava Ukraini, Hroyem Slava. Glory to Ukraine, glory to heroes. What we just experienced was a long and brilliant episode with a tremendous amount of digest, so I'm going to try to keep the business section short. Thanks are due all around. First, Thanks to Scott, Neil, Stephen, Jorn, and Louise for a truly mind-expanding episode. Neil points out eloquently that good research should lead to a thousand questions. A good surfing Nash tsunami episode should lead to at least a hundred, and heck, I've probably got twice that many running around my head right now. At the end of the episode, I suggested that Scott and Neil plan to join us two weeks after each major conference that has strong elements of basic science. The three that came immediately to mind for the rest of this year are Easel, Paris, Nash, and Oswald. After I left the podcast, I realized that NAFL Summit might be a fourth, and Nash tag next year 
January might be a fifth. I don't know how often I can ask these gents to join us, but four or five is probably the limit. What conferences would you choose and what priority? Please write the questions at surfingnash.com or post to the LinkedIn Facebook bulletin boards with your thoughts. Let's focus for a bit on the next two weeks. Next week, Jorn will be back with Jeff Lazarus and, I believe, Stephen to discuss the innovations in NAFL Care 2022 workshop taking place in Barcelona next month. Louise will not be with us, as I noted today. She'll be flying off to Australia. The next week, Stephen, Jorn, Naim Al-Khoury, Mazen Nouradin, and I hope Louise will be here to share thoughts about what the NAIL and IT retrospective analyses might be able to tell us for the U.S. Of the two remaining months in April, one will preview the fifth global NASH conference scheduled for late May, and the other will focus on a piece of research or, if I can get the people I want, our first discussion of how U.S. payers are thinking about NASH. If that doesn't happen in April, it will in May, and you will not want to miss it. Growing buzz. Interesting vault. First, a little buzz. I mentioned last week that the March audience has picked up considerably from February. As the month ends, it will clearly be our second biggest month ever. It will probably have a thousand more downloads than we had in October or November, which were virtually identical and the second and third biggest months until now. Episode 14 on balloon hepatocytes and episode 16 on data modeling have had better early uptake than any episode since the end of NASH. And in fact, with the exception of Splendor, anything since AASLD last fall. This quarter looks set to wrap up at around 16,000 downloads compared to 12,000 in the fourth quarter of 2021 and 15,000 for the second and third quarters of 2021 put together. Well, most of this week's downloads were for recent episodes. Episode 14 on the balloon hepatocytes, 15 wrapping up the CLDF meeting, and conversation 12-4, a 13-minute cut from last month's episode of Black History Month, asking what will improve NASH care for non-Hispanic Black Americans most and fastest. Beyond that, virtually anything from the end of NASH tag forward got interesting response in the past week. So with that, I want to thank Thank our team, Magic Mike, Eric, Steve, Murph the Magnificent, for a typically productive week. We are making some changes that I will probably discuss at the beginning of next week's episode and in the business report. So these folks have been busy preparing, and you'll hear soon. Well, you already heard about the endocrinology series today. And with that, I'm off. Stay safe. Surf on. I look forward to seeing you again next week on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Have any questions for the surfers? You can send them to surfingnash.com and we will answer on the podcast or the website.